Um, morning, everyone. My name is Quentin. I'm from uh, Spree.coza, and I'm here to talk about something called uh, the Strangler pattern. You've probably heard of it before. It's just a different name. Um, but it's something that we use to good effect to scale the Spree website. Um, I did Google for images on Strangler. It wasn't good. Um, so I went for the... <laughs> I went for the Zoolander thing, rather. So uh, Spree's an online fashion store. Uh, we focus especially on men, women, and kids' fashion. <laughs> so you think that's a lie, right? No? All right, no. Are they okay. just wondering what the other types of fashion are? <laughs> Dog fashion, maybe? Um, okay, cool. So yeah, so Spree, we started out, uh, we launched Spree in April 2013, and from the get-go, uh, lots of, lots of um, potential high growth, and that's not from one user to two users, um, that's thousands of users uh, per month. Within six months, we were doing millions of page views that last very straight lines, not fabricated. Um, but very early on in September, um, we started out with a very average-ish kind of page load time of about six and a half seconds in April, and soon that's just becoming untenable, so almost 15 seconds. Just six months later, you've just launched your startup. Um, so marketing's doing really well, tech isn't. Um, so just how bad is a 15-second page load? Um, but before we get there, any of you smart people might be thinking that the way to get more traffic is to build a slower website. That's not true. <laughs> um, so... Uh, the talk's really about uh, two things, performance and scale. So the first problem with the 15-second page load is if we look at this data, which is from 2013, um, it tells us that after about 10 seconds, 30% of your users just give up on using your website. And Spree's already at 15 seconds, so what are people doing? Seeing their header and then just, they're just going somewhere else, I guess. Um, so performance really is bad for UX, and abandonment's a really key thing in e-commerce. So we want people to go to a product page, add something to a cart, go to a cart page, go to checkout, go to some payment gateway and eventually get their goods. A lot of steps, a lot of areas to abandon. So the goal, before we get there actually, the goal, ideal goal these days is around about three seconds if you consider mobile um, devices as well. As techies, we kind of uh, give mobile a kind of back, kind of, kind of like backstage pass and say, well, we maybe expect mobile to be a little bit slower. So we are a little bit more patient, but real users actually expect mobile devices to be faster. Go figure. So um, not only did we suck at performance, we also sucked at scale. And so our version of the Twitter farewell page was this. So every time we'd send a few too many newsletters, or we'd have a spiky sale day, you'd get the we're packing our shelves kind of pun stupid page. So um, bad performance, bad scales, bad for business. So we had to go and think about all of this and figure out what we're going to do. Um, clearly, there was something terribly wrong with our, with our tech stack. Um, so uh, having a lot of time to think and research and really think out of the box, uh, we just did what everybody does, just cache everything. So um, we're running the Magento e-commerce framework, and Magento itself actually already had all of this stuff built in. It had Redis caching support. You could support um, slave databases uh, through MySQL. And we did all of that stuff. We had all the clustered database uh, set up going. We had Redis cache instances. We had the Magento Enterprise cache module. Enterprise, right? And it still didn't work. So, um, so we looked at this thing again. Being an e-commerce site, our designer got hold of this, of course. That's why it's an iMac thing, but it's, but it's pretty. So this whole page, we thought, well, let's just cache the damn thing. Um, our catalog listing pages, which is the busiest portion of any e-commerce site, I guess. Nobody can go directly to the cart, right? So um, the problem with trying to cache just everything, especially on an e-commerce site, is there's a lot of personalization. So I don't expect anybody to be able to read that, but usually in the header of your e-commerce site, you get things like menus and uh, you get your cart counts. That's me zooming into that little cart count section over there. So very, very personalized. It's your cart count. It's your favorites count. It's whether you logged in or not. And any one of those things change, and your cache is busted. So um, what we did was we shoved Varnish Cache in front of the website, cached all of these pages, separated the personalized components from the shareable, cacheable components, and we even cached the personalized components that way. But at least we could cache it per user and... You wouldn't go to the site and, just, and um, 
and it says, hi, Jonathan, and your name's not Jonathan. Um, so that was cool. We introduced basically more eventual consistency, and it was a really, really dumb cache from the start. Uh, we would say category pages, just cache those for half an hour. Product pages, maybe two minutes because of the sensitive TTL on like stock status. Um, anything static that had a hash in the URL, cache it for a year. And so the next sale, um, not even a year later, from April 2013, uh, dramatic, dramatic performance improvement for, um, for that month of sale, that huge spiky peak on the page view side, that's just the sale day. So uh, we've done three times as much page views we've ever done, ever, and the site was still up, amazing. And then um, insane performance improvement on page load time. Still nowhere near the kind of three second ideal kind of target, but a massive improvement, more than 50% improvement. So at this point, um, you kind of want to pat yourself on the back and call it a day. Um, but when you look beyond the averages and you look at the distribution of page load time, then you realize that 50% of, your, 50 of your requests are really great and the other 50% is not. Uh, so this is really bad in the sense that you get really, really snappy performance. You click from one pro product to a category to another, and then you discover a really, really slow page load. And some long tail latencies there, so I don't know if Tyler's still around. I think we need help there. Um, so 50% good, 50% suck, really. So back to the drawing board. Um, and realizing that we've done basically bonkers level kind of caching, um, what do you do next? Um, so we're thinking right now it's time for a paradigm shift. It's time to build that 10x scale solution. So um, we came across something called the Scale Cube. Uh, this is something that's been recently featured in an Nginx blog post, but it was first published in AKF Partners' blog and then a book called Art of Scalability somewhere in 2009. And basically, it's just a model for thinking about scalability. Don't go and try and build a cube when you get back to your desk at work. Um, the, the, the idea behind this kind of 3D scale uh, cube is that everybody starts at the bottom left um, at the y equals zero, x equals zero kind of point on your axis, and you build a monolith. And you, and you ship that, you ship it to the production, and as you begin to accrue more and more visitors to your site, um, you maybe now deploy that in a kind of cookie cutter scenario, you copy paste those web servers, you now run three instead of one. Um, and maybe then your database becomes the bottleneck, and now you introduce uh, slave databases and things. And you keep going along that x-axis, adding caches and things, but you never fundamentally change your architecture. So eventually you run out of stuff to do on the so-called x-axis, which is the clone things axis. And then the axis you could jump to next, perhaps is the split different things, where you want to do functional decomposition. So at some point, Facebook must have been doing a hell of a lot of signups per second per minute to get to uh, a billion users. So um, I've heard a story that they've scaled just their login or registrations as a separate kind of piece of functionality. So if you identify a specific portion of your site, like in an e-commerce site, the catalog site, which might be the busiest portion, that portion you might want to split off and say, well, keep the rest on the x-axis, but this new thing, I'm going to shove it off and, and, and carve it out of my architecture. And then finally, this is probably the Etsy territory. Um, you want to shard your data. Um, or shard by something, it could be by customer or by product SKU or things. So we looked at this thing, and for Spree, us being on the e-commerce, the Magento e-commerce framework, um, I think we could say a lot of homegrown uh, code bases would probably have f a fair amount of longevity on the x-axis, but Magento being the absolute donkey that it is, um, that x-axis is a lot shorter. So um, we realized we got to do the y-axis kind of thing. So I didn't mean to slate Magento, but it's just <laughs> happening. So I suppose it's allowable if I'm the dick uh, dissing my own software. Um, but so we've been using the Magento e-commerce framework. And um, a little bit about Magento, if you're not familiar with it. It's PHP, MySQL, 5.5 million lines of code. 20% of that is XML. I think 10% somewhere around JavaScript. And the rest, who knows what. <laughs> um, so. If you're talking about the y-axis kind of thing, right? how do we get there? How do we get to just carving a piece out of your e-commerce architecture, whatever software you've got, whatever complex software you've got? And usually, I mean, as developers, 
this is where we get to sell the Greenfields project to the project managers and business owners. So that's the top left thing. That's the voila option. That's the, hey guys, this platform sucks. Give me four months and I'll come back with this amazing new Node.js kind of system um, that talks to a NoSQL database and it's just going to be the way to do it. And then if you get that right, then a year passes by, maybe two years passes by, and you never quite get that second system deployed. Um, Fred Brooks talks about it as the second system effect in Mythical Man Month. Read about it, it's good. Um, and then the other option, bottom right, is kind of, well, maybe if your, op, maybe if your initial choices were really good um, and you want to stick with it, then you can go the refactoring option. So maybe, maybe you picture that Java is the ideal destination uh, uh, target technology and you're already doing Java. So all you've got to do then is perhaps refactor, change your framework, or change the way you're accessing database, I don't know. But the refactor option is usually, in its purest sense, where we, where we want to put a unit test suite over our current code base and change things incrementally and, and, um, and ship that every two weeks if you're doing scrum sprints or kind of thing. And then the bottom left options are non-option really, but I guess this happens at banks or uh, institutions with very, very strict change control, is you work in sprints, you do things every two weeks and you commit that, but you're only allowed to deploy once a year. Um, ex extreme, but it's, 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 it's a fact for, for some places. Um, and then the top right one is what the talk's really about, this strangler pattern. There's this other option, which maybe, I think a lot of people have actually done, tried, maybe don't know that it's called strangler, or maybe they actually know about a different name. This name was coined by uh, Martin Fowler, ThoughtWorks. Um, and the idea of the strangler is now you get this option to iteratively rewrite stuff. So it's kind of, it's an even better selling point to businesses. You can say, well, I want to rewrite this stuff, but I'm gonna at least gonna do it in um, nice increments. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's two months, instead of four months, six months, a year, making promises you really can't keep. So it's pretty, we looked at this and realized, okay, maybe we've gotta do our y-axis kind of stuff and try the strangler stuff. So the strangle pattern, um, the metaphor is derived from um, a um, certain tree that grows in certain regions of the world. I think this is Australia or something. Um, but the strangler vine is a vine that starts growing from the top of a fig tree, a very tall fig tree. And this happens in the jungle and stuff, so this is a ridiculous fig tree, not the one in your grandma's garden. Um, so the vine would actually, would actually start growing from the top of this tree and its vines would then grow out and around the, the host fig tree, wrapping the trunk until uh, the vines themselves make it to the soil. And once it, takes actual, once it actually takes root in the soil, that's when the host tree is just all but dead. So that's the metaphor for like iteratively um, uh, refactoring, let's say your legacy or your old slow app from something you don't like to something you want. So um, the vine, of course, the, the metaphor is also about this kind of indirection that the, that the vine is now absorbing nutrients and things that were intended for the host tree, and that's why the host tree eventually dies. So in reality, in software architecture, we, the kind of diagram stuff is, so what you do is you shove some kind of indirection layer in front of your website or your web app. I guess this is inapplicable to anything that resolves, any kind of DNS that resolves to an IP, uh, so it's not strictly for websites. So the idea is you shove the indirection layer in front of your legacy app, and of course, what we did as our bonkers caching layer was to do, we shoved varnish cache in front of our web app. So we had an indirection layer going on. And the idea is um, you'd actually begin then peeling off a vertical stripes out of your current architecture and start building your shiny new app. And once you're ready, um, and you think the shiny new app's ready for prime time, you can start sending some users to the shiny new app and you can maybe do it as a blue-green deployment or kind of A-B testing or whatever. We didn't bother with that stuff. Our, sh our old app was that crap that we just knew the new stuff was great. <laughs> so eventually you get to the point where you just continue and you continue um, uh, doing this process over and over. It's a kind of repetition. You can apply this pattern. You recognize, and in our case, we took search pages out, just the search page, built a new app, start, start shipping search pages to people on, on, on new tech and then we did our listing pages, and then we did our product pages, and we took one stripe out of the architecture at a time. So um, eventually, uh, the nice thing about this is 
it, it gives you a, a, a safety net. So at any time, if the shiny new app isn't that shiny, you can do that. That's the Mesosphere for PowerPoint plugin. Deploy. <laughs> Undeploy. Deploy. Um, we're going to open source that. So, um, so the cool thing is eventually you could maybe just, just stop sending requests to the old app. But the old app's still there, and you keep it around for just in case, because you don't know what that damn thing really does. Uh, the moment you switch it off, <laughs> the moment you switch it off is when somebody from some other department comes running in and says, my report doesn't work, or my, some form just stopped working or something, right? Where does this go? Which way does this go now? OK. OK. So the first thing we did was strangle our listing pages. And for any e-commerce site, please go to our site, and you can see this and not try and view it through a PowerPoint slide. Um, is that's the real critical portion of your listing page. Um, the rest of the stuff is just the regular kind of header, footer, fluff on like every site. And so those reusable, cacheable uh, UI components from our first um, iteration of caching, we can now reuse in our strangled listing pages. And so we did that. Um, how this kind of works in reality is what we did. Um, the y-axis scale cubing thing is we did kind of two strangler patterns here. So the first one being the indirection layer on top, of course. But then the second critical one was um, we sucked the catalog data from the Magento MySQL database into our Elasticsearch database. And Elasticsearch was a really good fit for that because it's document-oriented as well as being a search database. So previously, we would actually use Solar and MySQL to assemble listing pages. Solar does the heavy kind of lifting of figuring out what the uh, relevant results are, and then we have to fetch the product data and attributes out of MySQL. Um, a lot of round trips back and forth, and with the Elasticsearch, you could just fetch the result, and the result actually contains the whole product document. Brilliant. Um, so a lot of fit-for-purpose tech there, we felt. And um, naturally, we picked Node.js, um, thinking that um, Node.js, at least inherently, uh, solves the uh, 10,000 concurrent clients problem. That's, uh, that's sort of a bit of an academic kind of a white paper uh, published some time back. And it, of course, does that through um, e um, better evented IO as opposed to PHP, which is single threaded blocking. Most of the time, PHP apps are just waiting for mask, is just maybe waiting for MySQL to do something. Um, so that solves the problem of having to like, just suddenly scale to um, a big newsletter send. Um, and of course, we actually deployed uh, Node.js and Elasticsearch, and it was so competent, we didn't have to, we only needed to deploy it in a sort of high availability configuration. We didn't have to um, run tens or 20 um, instances of these things. We actually just needed one. Um, so from, I think what's, what's also different, different here in the case, um, we first did search pages, which was easy. We could just hijack a search URL. We could see a search URL coming into Varnish Cache, um, and simply we could see it had a query string in it, um, and we knew, okay, this, is, this should be a search URL, and we just hijacked that request. Um, instead of it going to the legacy app, it now goes straight to the Node.js app. Um, when we did listing pages, we decided to maybe do it a little bit differently. This time we're getting a bit smarter, a bit more confident about strangling stuff. So we changed the URLs completely for listing pages. For, for SEO reasons, really. So the cool thing is we actually, when we deployed uh, listing pages, which are you know, um, pages that you can, or product that you can browse by category, is that this time, um, we actually had the old system and the new system running together side by side. And so we deployed it like that, the old system's still running, and we could visit all of the new URLs and see, okay, things are still cool, we can still compare them side by side. And when we're confident, of course, we start sending uh, users off to the new system, and the old system just stops getting requests. Um, and the cool thing about that, the way we did that was this time was Magento was sort of cooperative in, in, in its demise. Magento itself now started generating URLs to the new app, which was really cool. Um, we threw in a bit of Redis. You know, you've got to do Redis somewhere. Um, <laughs> there's something more. Okay, nothing else in my notes. But Redis works for us, just, just saying. Um, <laughs> 
we know in your Etsy scale, so we, we definitely um, respect that. Um, so the next Black Friday sale, after we do all of these um, really iterative, uh, big rewriting, um, we discover the distribution's now a lot better. So now we've got 60% more page views getting served on top of the three times more page views that were getting served from the, from the caching uh, tweaks. And this time, average page load time drops by again by 1.5 seconds. So we're very, we're around about the four-ish second mark across all devices, which is pretty good because it, con it includes mobile. Um, oh, I thought it was another thing. Okay. So the other thing is, so we're really close to target. No more outages, no more fail pages. Uh, page load time improves by 25%. Um, but I think the problem is that, of course, is we're still looking at that distribution. We're still not getting most of our requests or most of our page load times in three seconds or less. But now it's, 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 it's definitely tilted in, in the right direction. I think it's about 65% at, at this stage. So we still have a bit of work to do. So the next thing we do is naturally rinse, repeat. You know, when something works, you just continue doing more of it. So um, this time, since we have our product data in Elasticsearch already, and we have this Node.js app running, um, we've got a bit of a framework to work with. So um, now struggling our product pages, we can just repeat more of the same stuff. The same header gets reused. Um, but this time, the trick with product pages is we can't get away with caching something for half an hour. So as we have to deal with uh, stock status. So this particular pair of jeans is almost very much sold out. So the scenario we want to protect against this time is a customer finds this pair of jeans, gets to the product page, clicks add to cart, and boom, sorry, it's out of stock. But the UI is still indicating that it's, that it's in stock. So not a great customer experience. So we fix that by just uh, tacking on a little bit of PubSub through RabbitMQ. So it's, an, it's, an, it's a new style of, or a new a variant of that strangler pattern is now Magento elegantly, I'll give it credit, it elegantly dispatches events um, when something happens in Magento, so when a product gets updated or changed or whatever. And we subscribe to those events, push it off to a rabbit, and your typical kind of PubSub stuff, our indexer now not only does batch indexing, but it also subscribes to this real-time stream. And so then we apply that to Elasticsearch, and again, Elasticsearch is really good for fit, uh, a good uh, fit for purpose here. Um, uh, because of its, of its real-time kind of uh, indexing component. So um, the moment you push a product into Elasticsearch, that new version of the document is immediately available, and, and then the indexing happens like a second or two later before it comes available in, in your search. So it's, it's, it's a really nice um, sort of document-oriented kind of feature, else we would have probably have to use something like Mongo along with Elastic and, you know. I've had experience with Mongo. I, I, I won't say anything else. Um, so, uh, so after strangling product pages, again, we revisit our distribution of page load time. And again, that improves really well. I think we're up to, we're serving 20% more pages, but I think we're up to about 70% or 80% of pages now getting served under three seconds. I lost it in my notes somewhere. Um, yeah, 60, actually, now we're actually only up to 65% of requests in three seconds or less. But page load time, so scalability improves again. Page load time, though, doesn't improve that much. It's sort of starting to plateau. But what we've been doing up to this case is really just scaling the back end. Um, and if you visit our site, you'll probably find that there's a lot of heavy CSS, JavaScript. And that's what that's kind of telling us right now, um, is we need to actually spend some time um, writing leaner CSS, JavaScript. We've got too many crazy frameworks, including me, including Magento's bonkers JavaScript framework. Um, so after doing all of that, um, this is what business lays on us. Guys, we need mobile apps. We needed it last year. Um, and not only are we thinking mobile apps that we, need to, um, that we need to actually get done, is we need to actually have a mobile first strategy. So at the moment, what I've shown you is a lot of screenshots of our desktop site, and that was really great. Um, but our mobile site was the kind of dot mobi kind of style of site. You give people a fraction of the functionality from the desktop site just so it looks decent on a mobile device, not very useful. Um, so we had to now think, well, how do we incorporate this mobile first strategy into our old school web architecture? So Magento, being designed in the, in the, in the pre-iPhone era, um, kind of has this clean separation of layers, um, except because it was designed in that era and abstractions are leaky, 
you will find a bit of presentation or a bit of um, coupling to a website um, kind of um, a kind of logic inside the business logic layer and maybe even down to the data source layer and vice versa upwards. So there isn't really that clean, clean layer of, separa of, uh, of, of separation there. Um, and what we figure out is um, we could just maybe get clients to talk directly to that business logic layer, um, but then we run into um, something that the, the Etsy talk alluded on is um, you have this problem now of clients having to make multiple requests to your backends, um, and that's really a problem. So um, we didn't get to visit Netflix, but we got to read the Netflix blog post. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so what we, what we realized from the Netflix blog post, um, it would have been nice to visit, visit Netflix, but yeah, is we needed an API gateway. We needed something that was capable of actually aggregating all of those back-end services calls so that your mobile client now makes one request to your API gateway and it says, well, give me all the stuff I need to display a product detail page. Um, and that's what we did. We shoved, we shoved in this idea of an API gateway, so another layer of abstraction, com computer science 101. Um, and then you can see, of course, now the business logic or the legacy app is just getting sort of shoved into the corner there. It's really starting to get overwhelmed and wrapped by this vine. And then we realized, we realized well, after the API gateway was built, and we could launch our mobile apps, iOS and Android, in November last year. Uh, oh, we needed to refresh our mobile website checkout. And we realized, well, you know what, since we built this REST API gateway, our, mobile, um, our new mobile checkout could actually be written as a single page app and consume the same API. So that's, um, if, if we'll, it's, at, the, at this point, you could see that you know the vines definitely seems to be overwhelming the host, and at this point, it seems like it seems like we're winning. So after we've done all of those things, we've launched mobile apps. The next big sale, Black Friday, the biggest one of the year. Um, this time again, we're really at 80% um, of our users um, or 80% of our requests getting served. Well, 80% of our page loads in its entirety, um, rendering within three seconds or completely rendering within three seconds. And then we're up again, 40% more page views getting served, so still more, more scalability. Um, average page load time on that day is now at 2.7 seconds. So we're quite close to that target. Of course, because of the average, we know that um, there's most likely people still suffering some long tail latencies. We really need Tyler's help. Um, and, and then mobile views, because you know, mobiles don't do page loads, but mobile views are now at, at, at an average of like one second built on this new kind of architecture. That's some kind of reinforcement that we're doing the right thing. So at the moment, we can say that scale problem for now is kind of solved, but we know that it's ongoing. Again, that reiterates at this time, we still got to spend quite a bit of energy or effort on our front end performance. So after doing all of this funky strangling kind of stuff, we grow really confident, um, really creative, and we have a few crazy ideas now. So um, in the very first slide when I introduced the Strangler pattern, it was all about completely getting rid of the, the, the old legacy app. But when we looked again at our, at our stack, um, we were inspired by this idea called command query responsibility segregation. This, of course, is not a pure implementation of that, but just inspired by that, we could see, well, our catalog system now is actually all the writes are going to Magento on the admin or the, or the back office kind of side of it, and all the reads are going to our shiny new app. And we we're like, well, why bother rewriting the whole catalog system if the back office is just being used by five or six people internally? Why not keep it? Why not formalize that idea of splitting the reads and the writes between these two systems and, and just bolster that data integration? Um, so that's... That's typically what we kind of do now is we don't, we don't maybe uh, try and strangle the entire apps. We look for maybe these kinds of opportunities and say, well, um, in the case of like our CMS pages, the back office is still ma clunky magento. People, edit, people add and change CMS pages, but the read side of our CMS pages is actually just getting served 
um, out of Varnish Cash. We didn't even bother building a shiny new app for that. And so we, we kind of look at things where, where there's a marginal bit of eventual consistency that, 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 that is allowable. Then we'll try and go for these kinds of setups where we don't rewrite an entire system because rewriting back office kind of tons of forms is just boring and time consuming and it's just not necessary. The other cool trick uh, we realize with once we have this indirection layer in um, is if business comes up with new ideas, stuff they want to throw against the wall, um, then generally as developers, we kind of want to build good software, we want to build the right thing, and we want to kind of over-invest in just this thing they want to try out. Um, so in the way that we were reusing um, those, those components, those UI components, we can quickly assemble prototypes, add into the architecture as something that's completely independent, that just gets rooted to, and if it doesn't work out, we just undeploy it. We just stop using it. And we never actually take on that as an investment into our, our more mature code bases. More, that's a, that's a bit more Mesos there. Um, and then the last thing is, is realizing, well, um, we're looking at this monolith that we've, been, um, that we've been carving things out of and we figure out that, well, we, we kind of do need to figure out what's our destination. If we just keep sucking things out of the monolith um, into one new app that just continues to grow and grow and grow, we're just building a new monolith. We're just repeating the same thing, but maybe we're just doing it slightly better. Um, so, the, so the reverse is true. I guess if somebody came across this kind of architecture and they felt, well, no, that's, that's bonkersly weird. Um, I want to fix that. I can always go in the reverse. So a recap, and I didn't mean to speed through all the stuff so quickly, but I did. Fortunately, I had this Mesos demo. Um, <laughs> is the recap is really is is it's possible to iteratively rewrite something. You know, these uh, I think in 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 our industry we we obsessed with these extremes where it's got to be small refactorings or one giant rewrite. What's got to be monolith? What's got to be microservice? And there's nothing in between. Um, you can do all of these really, really big changes with absolutely zero downtime. And none of these things caused any downtime, except our ISP who occasionally did weird stuff with their networking. Um, and it's possible to do this kind of just-in-time scaling. Um, I, I, we literally did these things. Um, just before any major sale, we knew we had to fix the new bottleneck in our software. And the great thing is, um, after fixing the bottleneck is when you go to your new Relic panel, you now, you now see what the new bottleneck is. So the next time you do the next sale is you know, okay, I've got to concentrate on X or Y. Uh, that wasn't performing so great in the last sale. And um, the caching thing would, at, at, at early on was really cool because um, I think what it shows is that you could do something really, really effective and then you can't do any more of it. Um, and the same goes with perhaps with, with even strangling we were strangling vertical strips out of our architecture, which is very, very time consuming, a lot of effort. Um, but uh, you can hit, these, uh, hit this kind of plateau where you keep doing something and it doesn't work. And the scale cube is a nice paradigm to go, well, I need to scale something. Where is it at right now? Is it on X, Y, or Z? Should I jump to X? Should I jump from X to Y, or should I jump straight to Z? And maybe if you do consider jumping from X to Y, and you now have this opportunity to pick a database or a new database, is now you can think ahead to think, well, if I do pick a new database um, as I decompose the catalog side out of, let's say, Magento and MySQL um, to Node.js and Elasticsearch, then maybe I should pick a database that just automatically does sharding really well. So when I need to get to Z, it's an infrastructure tweak, not a I have to build my own kind of sharding ORM on top of MySQL kind of thing. And this uh, bullet aligned architect with businesses, I think you should, uh, as, an, as an architect, as a team, uh, respond to business strategies, and your architecture should, should really mirror that. Um, I, think, I think a lot of us um, in our industry tend to want to build this beautiful abstract architecture that is capable of solving the, the problems that we think we can predict or the problems that might happen in future so that we never have to respond to building prototypes for business. 
And the last one is, well, I don't think we're really gonna strangle Magento away completely. As long as there's some good stuff to keep, then why not keep it? Why not just keep using it if it's not hurting you? Um, so I think there is opportunity to, um, to do the strangler pattern. And in some cases, you might actually have to strangle that entire legacy or slow app. But some cases, maybe the good stuff is still worth keeping around. For us, if we actually went back to um, where we were you know, making these vertical services that we were pulling out of Magento, if we took out cart, checkout, favorites, and the catalog out of Magento, then maybe what's left is customer profiles. And by doing that, we've actually now created a customer profile service by actually, by actually taking other things out of Magento. Um, so that's something to consider. And I think, look, lastly, I've badmouthed Magento quite a lot, but you've got to respect uh, whatever legacy um, app it is that you're working on. Um, uh, respect what it does. In order to do the things we did, we actually had to learn a lot about the innards of Magento, how it really works, where we could hook things into, where we could cleanly um, identify these boundaries in the architecture. We could clearly identify that this is the catalog portion, this is the cart or the checkout portion. This is where I can cleanly actually write new Magento code to actually intercept those events and publish that to another system that can subscribe to those events. So we still have a Magento code base, but we haven't hacked any of its core files. And I think this is related to the last slide, is if you're doing the strangling stuff, um, is to be self-aware that uh, as you're moving from you know, the old code or to some new code base, is that don't repeat the architecture of the old code base, else you're just building a newer, slicker version of what you already have. So for us, when we looked at that, um, and it's popular to hate on monoliths these days. I don't see anything wrong with the monolith. I think everybody should start with the monolith. It's the most probably flexible thing to start with right at the beginning, iterate on, figure out what works for your business. But as you discover that maybe the bad attributes of a monolith at scale, um, you then might, what we do is also consider then a service-based architecture. Um, and I'm calling it service-based, I'm not calling it service-oriented or microservices. Uh, I, I don't even think at this stage we're ready for the full-blown kind of microservices idea. But we're certainly kind of heading that way. But we're just taking one sort of a strategic step at a time and trying to minimize that complexity of going full-blown services. So that's the end. I just have one last thing, a little surprise. Uh, I spoke to our marketing team, and they've uh, generously offered this 20% off coupon. Comes with TNCs. I'm not trying to hide the TNCs, but they get in the way of the pretty ribbon. Um, so you're 20% off 400 Rand or more. Um, it excludes, I think, Nike and Mango, because uh, I don't think we're just not allowed to discount those brands. We're not um, being funny. Um, but it's, a, it's valid until March 2016, and that's for everyone who just absolutely hated this talk. Uh, remember, we are doing question of the day um, for the coffee. I've got so, one back here. Just how, how much do you think we spent on coffee yesterday? 15,000. Hi, I have a question. I was just wondering how you got Redis to work. <laughs> oui. Oui. Okay. I'm just kidding. Um, I was actually wondering how, what factors you use to decide what bad code is. Sorry, accent so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you were, you were saying um, what factors we use to decide whether, whether you have bad code? Yeah, what are the most important factors? Like what, it, what starts to smell and gives you a hint at the fact well, that it might I, be bad code? I think the key thing, maybe one thing that I left out was, you know, every architecture, every product has, must have quality attributes and that's, that it has to be explicit upfront. So something that's maybe implicit for a lot of software um, is that it should be performant or should be scalable, but nobody says it should be. Um, and so it's not incorporated. So for, so for us, um, if software doesn't meet some of 
the quality attributes that's needed for that system, and it could be performance, scalability, extensibility, maintainability, all the illities, then, then it's bad in the sense that it's not good for us. But um, it's subjective, I suppose, whether it's good or bad. Um, if we want to talk at low level kind of object oriented design patterns or something. Does that answer the question? Okay, so I've got, I've got this apple in my left hand here. That, do I get some coffee? <laughs> um, damn it. Um, how, you talk a lot about optimizing for your client load latencies, and how did you measure those? Did you use, use Google Analytics, or how did you measure your clients, your client response times, your client oh. request uh, response so, times? Okay, so the first, the first thing I've got to share, I was going to say, is what we did was I communicated about page load time, because I think it's the most easily uh, understood metric uh, for measuring user, per user perceived performance. Um, so we used uh, New Relic um, quite a lot for the application performance monitoring. We used its, uh, its, its browser um, RAM monitoring for a while, um, but those, those numbers I was really quoting from, those RAM, uh, those RAM uh, metrics was from Google Analytics. Um, and typically we look at page load time and document interactive time as, as a RAM metric. Um, the, the resource timing metrics aren't really universal uh, just yet. Um, so those are still kind of old school, but still really useful as RAM metrics. Uh, but every time we do some kind of optimization, we then do this kind of synthetic uh, benchmarking as well. So webpagetest.org is really helpful for that. Um, and I think what we'll be doing is soon adopting the webpagetest.org metric of start render, um, which is probably the best way of determining how soon something is beginning to display on the screen for a user. So you can have an overall page load time of like two seconds, but if the user's waiting two seconds to see the page, then it's not that great, is it? Hi. Uh, I'm more than happy to help with your long tail latency, just, just saying. Um, but no, I, I, I thought it was really interesting uh, when you were talking about using Varnish to do uh, partial page caching um, as well, uh, because Fastly or CDN is based entirely on Varnish, so we see people trying to do this type of thing all the time. And I'm curious to see or to hear uh, how did your strategy regarding page caching change uh, as you started rewriting more and more of the app? Oh, so like initially it was very, very dumb. We literally were adding in URLs into our Varnish cache configuration. I'd browse the site and go, oh shit, that URL's missing the cache. Go to my VCL, add, add the URL, push the code and restart and reload that, that Varnish VCL configuration. But eventually what we did, um, uh, what we did was to realize that what we need to do is, is to be able to create rootable URLs, uh, URLs that machines understand, and, and step away just a little bit from the very purest kind of SEO URLs, where you create this very opaque URL that a computer doesn't understand. So spiritcoza slash lady slash shoes, we know as users that's probably the category lady shoes, but as a computer looks at that and goes like, well, I don't know. So we added in the word category um, to help with that kind of routing to the appropriate service. Um, of course, in a very SEO sensitive way. So that was one thing that we needed to do. Uh, the other thing is once we began doing all of these things, we started to refactor varnish. Um, and that's the one slide I didn't include, I didn't think we had time. Um, we started to refactor our kind of varnish uh, to act as a kind of a surrogate in front of our web servers. So Varnish now becomes more as a, as a caching service. So as a, a request comes in, um, Varnish would advertise its capabilities to, to a backend. So it's indicating to the backend, I'm, I'm a surrogate that understands, I think surrogate 1.0, whatever, I can do ESI 1.0, and then the web server backend goes, okay, cool, so that means I can tell you to cache this a particular piece of content for a certain amount of time, and I can tell you to perform ESI processing on that page. Um, so that was a really cool way of kind of formalizing that indirection. So when we started with the varnish being really kind of just dumb and just overbearing, it just became this like caching service in front of all of our web servers. Um, a lot of this stuff, I think, um, varnish is beginning to like support out of the box now, but this you can implement in pure VCL and it's just a few lines of code. Um, the other thing, of course, is I didn't want to get in too much to, because I thought it might just impede time, is 
the idea of edge side includes it's kind of these Russian dolls where every time you saw these reusable UI components and there was a box within a box within a box within a box, that's what Varnish is doing. Every time it gets a request, um, it sees the HTML generated by the back end and sees just a simple HTML tag called, called ESI something. And that's an instruction to Varnish to go, oh, okay, I've got to fetch now the sub resource from another back end. So this is a cool way of, of being able to reuse UI components between different services without the services actually knowing through service discovery where that service might be. It's Varnish's job to do that. Does that answer the question? Yay. So I, I, I thought I might get a question from you, because CDL fastly. Um, and I know you guys, I think you forked Varnish 2 or something like that. Yeah. So there's a lot of features I think that we read actually off the Fastly blogs and go like, shit, okay, let's see if we can implement that in, in open source varnish. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's, that's another way of looking at, at that Russian doll kind of thing, is every page on a, on a website, especially e-commerce site, it has a dominant uh, feature, like a product, detail, product page would be the product page, but there's other sort of secondary supplementary kind of components being included there. <coughs> so our service is really, our catalog service only does the catalog portion. And the rest that tells Varnish, hey, get these, get these includes from the other services, and the other service would, would then respond to only do that particular portion that it needs to do. Thanks very much, Quentin.